right. What's the Torah portion for today? It's Matot Masai. And what does that mean? Tribes is Matot and Masai is journeys. And we're going to go on a wonderful journey today. Now, let me ask you, how many have ever heard this phrase? Your sin will find you out. Anybody heard of that? Where does that phrase come from? Does anyone know where we find it? It's in this Torah portion. That's where it comes from. So we'll find it here. Let's start with Numbers 30, verse 1 and 2. Moses spoke to the heads of the Matot, the tribes of the children of Israel. And he said, this is what the Lord's commanded. When you vow a vow or swear an oath and bind your soul with a bond to the Lord, you better not break your word and you will do according to all that proceeded out of your mouth. This is why even in the Gospels, it says it's best not to make a vow. Why make a vow and put yourself under an obligation? Just do it. That way, if you don't succeed, you're not obligated. So really, it's stupid to make a vow. It really is. Just do what you're going to say you're going to do. You know, uh, and that's, more that's the most important thing. And that's what Yeshua even said. Now, let's look at Numbers. <clears throat> the next chapter, 31, verse 1 through 6. We just heard about what happened with Phineas, and we're grateful for Dandy Ben Gigi filling in this last weekend. Uh, I was up in Alaska taking a break. It was a lot of fun. Uh, but here it goes. It says, the Lord tells Moses, avenge the children of Israel for the Midianites. So in one sense, the Lord is telling Moses, I want you to avenge Israel. And then he says, and after that, you're going to die. So if I was Moses, I would put off avenging <laughs> the children of Israel, okay? But, so Moses spoke to the people, and he said, Arm yourselves for the war, the battle, that they may go against Midian to execute the Lord's vengeance. Okay, so he said, Moses, I want you to go get your vengeance. And then Moses says, no, we're going to do vengeance for the Lord. We know vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And then he says, we're going to grab a thousand people out of each tribe. So that's going to be 12,000 people that are armed for the war. And what's interesting here, it says after the bold to the war, Phineas, the son of Eliezer, the, pay, uh, the priest, went to the war with the vessels of the sanctuary, the shofars for the alarm in his hand. That word is teruah. And this is where we get the idea of Yom Teruah on the Feast of Trumpets. You're sounding an alarm, which also gives the idea of an alarm clock waking the dead up. It's all tied together here. But I want you to notice the priests were to lead the battle. Why is that important? Today in Israel, none of the religious want to fight at all. All they want to do is sit and study Torah, and it drives the rest of Israel nuts. Why are we sacrificing our lives, and all you want to do is study Torah? The situation is Torah is practical, and they're not doing what is practical. They're not actually following Torah by only wanting to study Torah, but not do what the Torah says. Because in the Torah, the priests were to lead them in the battle and bless them and say prayers for them. And so the big problem in Israel today is they don't have enough troops. And so the ones that are there have to work an extra three or four months. All right. And they're worn out. They're worn out. So this is really bad that the Torah followers in Israel refuse to follow Torah. But they claim that they are. Aside from that, let's move on here. Um, now, if you remember... Zechariah 4, 6, it's not by power, not by might, but by my spirit. That's how we're going to win the battles. And Numbers 31, 8, what do we see? They killed the kings of Midian with the rest of their slain. And when you read, they killed the five kings of Midian and 
Balaam, also the son of Beor, they killed with the sword. Yay. And then in 32, 1, it talks about how the children of Reuben and the children of Gad had a very great multitude of livestock. And as they're moving into the promised land here, when they saw the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead, that behold, the place was a place for livestock. Now, if you got a bunch of livestock and you found the most perfect place for livestock, you may want it. But guess what? It wasn't the promised land. They hadn't even seen the promised land. They didn't believe or trust God that he had a place that may be even better on the other side. So look what happens. In verses five through seven, they said, hey, if we have found favor in your sight, let this land be given to your servants for a possession. Don't bring us over the Jordan. And Moses said to the children of Gad and to the children of Reuben, shall your brothers go to the war while you sit here? Why do you discourage the heart of the children of Israel from going over into the land which the Lord has given them? So look at what they say, but I want you to detail it. Really detail what they say. They came near to him and listen to what they said. We will build sheep folds here for our livestock and cities for our little ones, but we ourselves will be ready armed to go before the children of Israel until we have brought them to their place and our little ones will dwell in the fortified cities because of the inhabitants of the land. And we won't return to our houses until the children of Israel have inherited every man his inheritance. You know the big problem with this? Their priority was building the sheepfolds, not safe places for their kids. Look at their priority. They put building the sheepfolds for their livestock, they placed higher than they did their children in building places of safety. Well, let's look how this transpires now. If we go to Numbers 32, 23, Moses says, okay, but if you will not do so, behold, you sinned against the Lord and be sure your sin will find you out. Here they had, you know, made a vow. And then look what Moses says to them the next verse. He reverses their order. And he says, look, I want you to build cities for your little ones and folds for your sheep and do that which has proceeded out of your mouth. So here he's saying, you know, if you make a vow, you're in big trouble. You better keep it. And here Reuben and Gad made a vow and now they've got to keep it. So let's look at verses 31 through 33. The children of Gad and the children of Reuben answered saying, as the Lord has said to your servants, so we will do. We will pass over arm before the Lord into the land of Canaan and the possession of our inheritance is going to remain with us over here. So Moses gave to them, even to the children of Gad and to the children of Reuben and to the half tribe of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, the kingdom of Sihon, king of the Amorites, the kingdom of Og, of the king of Bashan, the land according to its cities and borders, even the cities of the surrounding land. Now, wait a minute. The half tribe of Manasseh didn't say they wanted to go over there. Why are they put in? Does anyone know why the half tribe of Manasseh went? God had Moses send half of them over there so there would remain a connection between the two. If just Gad and Reuben went, oh my goodness, they would have lost their connection. They would have created their own temple, their own altar. And Moses and God did not want that to happen. So half went there and half stayed. Now, what do we find? <clears throat> In Numbers 32, 39 through 41, the children of Machir, the son of Manasseh, he went to Gilead and he took it. He dispossessed the Amorites, which was in it. And Moses gave Gilead unto him, Machir, the son of Manasseh, and he dwelt there. And Yair, the son of Manasseh, went and took the small towns and called them the city of Yair. I think it's interesting that it's not the Reuben or Gadites that first take the land. It's the half tribe of Manasseh that went over there that's having all the success. And that brings us to the next tour portion, which means journeys. Now look at Numbers 33, 1 and 2. These are the journeys of the children of Israel, which went out of the land of Egypt with their armies 
under the hand of Moses and Aaron. And Moses wrote their goings out according to their journeys by the commandment of the Lord. And these are their journeys according to their going out. God commanded Moses to write down their journeys. You know what that means? God likes to scrapbook. He, he wanted, my kids are just like when you go on vacation and you keep a scrapbook of your vacation. God wanted to forever have recorded their journeys as they're leaving Egypt and going into the promised land. So he told Moses, I want you to write down every step of their journey. Now, the interesting thing, that word also comes from a word journeys means a departure. Okay, that's what it means. Not only journeys, but it involves a departure. They're leaving Egypt. Uh, there's another word, nasa, which is very similar to masa, and it means to pull up the tent stakes. Okay, the point of departure. And this is the point that I'm making for us. There comes a time in life when we have to pull up the tent stakes and move, especially out of Egypt. It's called being born again. We are pulling up the tent stakes of our old life. We're starting a new journey, and we're not to go back. So look at Numbers 33, 38, 39. And Aaron, the priest, went up to Mount Or at the commandment of the Lord, and he died. In the 40th year after the children of Israel were come up out of the land of Egypt, on the first day of the fifth month, that's the first of all, that's Monday. So this Monday is when this event happened. And we see Aaron was 123 years old when he died in the mount. Okay, if Aaron, how old was Moses when he died? 120. So we see Aaron was three years older than Moses. Uh, Miriam was seven, 127 when she died. So she was seven years older. Now, here's what's fascinating. Talking about journeys. Here they're talking about when they pulled the stakes up and they left Egypt, right? Okay, how long was Moses with his natural mother? Okay, a little bit. And then as a baby, he's put in the reeds. And then Pharaoh's daughter gets them, and she ends up raising him for 40 years. Okay, he knew he had a, a mother, but now when do Jewish people name their child? On the eighth day. So that means, and we know Pharaoh's daughter is the one who named him Moses. So what was his real name that was given to him on the eighth day? That's not Moses, isn't his name? He has a Hebrew name that was given to him. And so do we know what his real name was? Moses, she pulled him out of the water. She named him, but that wasn't his real name. That was a name the Gentiles gave him, not the real name that the Jews gave him. Just like Jesus isn't the real name, it's Yeshua. What was Moses' real name he was given on the eighth day? The Bible tells us in code, Tovia, exactly. That was his real name. That was his name, Tovia. Isn't that fascinating? But now think about this. I, I hope all of you love your mothers. Here he had his mother, who was Pharaoh's daughter, who raised him for 40 years. Don't you think he would want his mother to go with him when they crossed the Red Sea? I mean, 80 years have gone. He's now 80 years old. She could be 97 or something like that if she was 17 years old when she adopted him. But anyway, you know he'd want his mom, his Egyptian mother, to go with him. Do you think she went with him? The Bible tells us she did. And nobody sees it. So I'm going to show you where it is. Does anybody know Pharaoh's daughter's name? Who knows Pharaoh's daughter's name? Nowhere, nowhere is it mentioned except one place, and it's not in the Torah. So we're going to find out what her name was. Here we go. And I think it's amazing. In Exodus 2, 5 through 11, it says, And the daughter of Pharaoh 
came down to wash herself at the river. Her maidens walked along the riverside, and when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. And she had compassion on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. How did she know? He was circumcised. And then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, do you want me to go and call a nurse of the Hebrew women that she can nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said, go. And the maid went, called the child's mother, and Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give you even wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it, and the child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses. Do you see that? And it says, because I drew him out of the water. And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, he went out to his brethren and looked on their burdens, and he spied an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, one of his brethren. Okay, now as you know, we have like the Schofield Bible and all these Bibles with uh, commentary. There's Jewish commentary about this. And in this midrash, it actually attributed the salvation of all of Israel to the daughter of Pharaoh. All of Israel got saved because the daughter of Pharaoh took Moses. Wow, that's amazing. Well, guess what? This is what they say happened when that happened. Just like the astrologers who talked to Herod, we saw his star in Bethlehem, we come to worship the king. There were uh, Pharaoh's astrologers also saw in the stars that someone destined to save Israel would be punished through water. That is why Pharaoh made a decree in Exodus 1.22, every boy that is born, you shall throw in the Nile. Okay, just like Herod wanted to kill every boy that was born. It happened back then. And so they wanted to throw every boy into the Nile in order to kill the deliverer because the deliverer, it says, would be punished through water. And so... Once Moses had been placed in the water as a baby, the astrologer says we no longer see that sign, and so they canceled the decree. So Pharaoh's decree was revoked after Moses had been placed in the water. But it says the Midrash adds that the astrologers were partially correct to a certain degree since Moses was punished by water when he sinned at the waters of Meribah in striking the rock. Fascinating. Now, they also say, why was Pharaoh's daughter even going to the river, right? They say it was to be as a mikvah because she wanted to cleanse herself from the idols of her own father's house. All right. Now, here we always hear Pharaoh's daughter. We don't hear her name. Okay. Here you're going to find his mother did cross the Red Sea with the nation of Israel. She had converted to Judaism. His mother did. She was part of the mixed multitude that came out. So let's find out where do we find all of this is true. Look at 1 Chronicles 4, 15 through 18. The sons of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and it mentions them and it says, all these are the sons of Bithia, the daughter of Pharaoh. Right there it is. His mother was named Bithia, which, uh, which Merced took, one of the Jewish people took. Okay, now, what does her name mean? This is her Hebrew name is Bat Yah, daughter of God. And it says she received that name from God as a reward for her actions. And God told her, Moses was not your son, yet you called him your son. Well, you are not my daughter, but now I will call you my daughter. Isn't that amazing? And it's all because she saved the Jewish people. And it's right there. Here's a phenomenal story of the Exodus we find in First Chronicles. 
the answer. This is what happened when you connect the dots with all of this. Okay, so now we go to Numbers 33, verse 50 through 53. The Lord tells Moses, and he's in the plains of Moab by the Jordan at Jericho. Speak to the people of Israel and tell them when you pass over the Jordan to the land of Canaan, this is what I want you to do. I want you to drive out all the inhabitants from before you. I want you to destroy all their figured stones or idols and destroy all their metal images and demolish all their high places and take possession of the land and settle in it for I've given the land to you to possess it. So what were they to do as soon as they got there? What was the first order of business? Drive out the inhabitants. And he says, if you don't, they're going to remain there and be thorns in your side. And look where we are today because they didn't do that. But here, they're to drive them out. And then it says, I want you to destroy their figured stones, destroy their images, demolish their high places. That was the first order of business. And then he says in verse 55 and 56, if you don't drive out the inhabitants from before you, it'll come to pass. Those that you let remain will be pricks in your eyes, storms in your sides. They'll vex you in the land where you dwell. Moreover, it'll come to pass and I will do to you as I thought to do to them. They still inhabit Gaza. To this day, they've let them remain. And that is the whole problem. They're not fulfilling the Torah. And so... Hamas has become a thorn in their side. Now, let me ask you something. The Gaza Strip belonged to which tribe? Judah. Yeshua is from what tribe? In the natural, the Gaza Strip belongs to Messiah. That's why they're inhabiting the Gaza Strip. Amazing how all of this works. Yeah, wow. Okay. Moving on. What time is it? Okay. Let's jump to the Haftarah for a second, which means the part of the Tanakh that ties into the Torah portion. Look at Jeremiah 2, 5 and 6. This is amazing. Thus says the Lord, what iniquity have your fathers found in me that they've gone from far from me? They've walked after vanity and they've become vain. Neither did they say, where is the Lord? They didn't even know God had left. Oftentimes, do we, are we even aware God's not around? And it's not only just the Lord, but it's the guy who saved us, who brought us out of Egypt, that led us through the wilderness, through the land of deserts and pits, a land of drought, the shadow of death, through a land that no man passed through and where no one dwells. I mean, this is their ultimate savior, their ultimate father, their ultimate friend, and they don't even remember he exists. Is that any way to treat someone who does everything for you? And look at verse 7 and 8. He says, also I brought you into a plentiful country to eat the fruit and the goodness. But look what happens when you entered it. You immediately defiled the land. You made my heritage an abomination. And the priests didn't even ask, where is the Lord? If there's anyone that's supposed to be the mediator between man and God, it's the priest. And the priest didn't even know he had left. Wow, how does that figure? And they, that, then it says, and those who handled the Torah don't even know me. I mean, it's one thing to love the Torah and start following the Torah, but... The ones who handle the Torah don't even know me? How many people are there? I mean, how many have ever heard of Leonard Dravenhill? He was one of my teachers, okay? Yeah, and what was amazing to me, he wrote this book, Sodom Had No Bible. Now, when you think about it, what happened to Sodom? And they didn't have a Bible. That's why he says in the Gospels, you're going to suffer more than Sodom did. There's probably 10 Bibles in everybody's house and nobody reads them. They have a nice big family Bible that's all dusty. Okay, here, the, and it's not just the normal person, it's the priest, the one who's supposed to handle the Torah. And how many Messianics or even the Torah followers today handle the Torah, but they don't know the author of the Torah? 
It's all legalism. That's why I call it messy anic. Okay? Because they are, are totally into the legalistic aspect and they want everyone to look uh, like a Jew. It's called a costume party. Okay? Everyone who's not Jewish, I want you to all dress like a Jew and follow that part and then you're saved. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Okay? So many of these Messianic groups, you go in there, and not one of them is Jewish, but they all are playing costume party. Okay. And then it says, even the pastors transgress against me. The prophets prophesy by Baal and walk after things that don't even profit. This is where we find in Revelation 3.20, he's talking to a church and he says, he's standing at the door of the church and knocking. And he says, hey, if anyone in there hears my voice, you know, we'll go have dinner together. And everyone in the church is going, leave us alone. We're having church. And they don't even know the Messiah is not in there. He's outside saying, come out here, guys. <clears throat> and then what do we find in Jeremiah 2.11? Has a nation changed their gods, which aren't even gods? And then look what he says. It's not the heathen, it's my own people who have changed their glory for that which doesn't profit. Now, let's look at Romans 1, 22 and 23. Here it talks pe about people who profess to be wise, but they're fools. Why? Because they changed their glory. Just like Jeremiah 2 says, they've changed their glory. For that which doesn't profit, here in Romans, the people of God are changing the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, to birds, four-footed beasts, creepy crawlers. And then look at Jeremiah 2, 12 and 13. It goes on and says, be astonished, you heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid, and be very desolate, says the Lord, because it's my people who have committed two evils. Number one, they've hewn, uh, oh, they have forsaken me and the fountains of living waters. And they've hewed out sisters, broken sisters that can hold no water. Wow. This here is saying that Yeshua is the fountain of living waters and they have forsaken him. And then in verse 25, Look at what they said. They said, oh, there is no hope for I have loved strangers and after them will I go. And so here they think, oh, it's too late. I've already blown it. So I'm just going to continue to blow it. Now in this Torah portion also is the story of the Sota. What is that? This is the woman who's been suspected of committing adultery. And then she has to drink this mixture of like dirt and water and drink it. And if she hadn't been, she gets pregnant. So a lot of the women would purposely make it look like they committed adultery because they were barren. And they knew that if they did that, they'd become pregnant. But if they were guilty, bad things would happen not only to her, but to the man. Now look at what happens in Numbers 5. 16 and 17. It says, the priest will bring her near and set her before who? The Lord. And then the priest takes holy water in an earthen vessel and of the dust that is in the floor of the tabernacle. And the priest takes it and puts it in the water. Okay, according to the Torah, the Sotah law kicks in when a man suspects his wife of being unfaithful and warns her to not seclude herself with a particular other person. If it is established that she ignored the warning, then she becomes subject to the ritual that involves her drinking a concoction of water, a bit of dirt from under the temple's marble floor. Now, here's the temple. Now, during Moses' day, the tabernacle was sitting on dirt and they could grab the dirt was accessible, but the temple had completely marble floors. And this is actually some of the marble floor that they found and discovered that was in Herod's temple during Yeshua's day. But underneath one of those squares, they would lift it up and there'd be a patch of dirt that they would use. 
during Yeshua's time. They purposely didn't, you know, cement that part in. And so that's what they used. And we uh, find in uh, John, we're going to go there in just a minute, but uh, what I want you to realize, they had to have holy water put in an earthen vessel, right? Yeshua had an earthen vessel and he had the living water. Aha. Uh -huh. Now look at John 7, 37 and 38. It was the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, the great day of the feast. And Jesus stood up and he cried out and says, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. He that believes on me, as the scripture says, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. So here we see he is filled with the river of living water. And now look at verse 45 and 49. Now, what comes after Shemini at Soret is the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles, and the next day is called what? Simchat Torah, rejoicing in the Torah. So we just realize now, if you know biblical calendar, this is the day everyone's supposed to be rejoicing in the Torah, and the Pharisees are using the Torah to kill someone. They don't know the Lord. And what happens? Then come the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees. And they said unto them, why did you not bring us Yeshua? And the officers answered, no one ever spoke like this guy. And then the Pharisees said, are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed on him? But the people who don't know the law are what? Wow, well, guess what? They're cursed because they don't know the king who made the laws. So who's the one that is cursed is the ones who proclaim they know the Bible, but they are clueless. They don't know the person of the Bible. They, first, they have just forsaken the fountain of living waters. Do you see how they just forsook the fountain of living waters? Because Yeshua yelled that out. Well, let's go to John 8. Jesus goes to the Mount of Olives. This is on Simchat Torah. Early in the morning, he came again into the temple. All the people came to him and they sat down and taught them. Oh, he sat down and taught them. And now what happens? The scribes and the Pharisees bring a woman who was taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to them, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Well, guess what? According to the Torah, you have to bring the man and the woman. Oh, well, how come they didn't bring the man? Because it probably was one of them. Okay. Now, look at John 8, 6 to 8. This they said, tempting him that they might have a reason to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger, he wrote on the ground as if he didn't even hear him. And so when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, whoever is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. And again, he stooped down and continued to write on the ground. Here, the living water has his finger in the dirt to take to the woman. And if they find out who the man is, he has the same thing happen. And the man is probably one of them. But watch this. Do you remember Look at Jeremiah. Oh, how many of you know what he was writing? Did anybody know what he was writing on the ground? Here it is. It tells us they had just forsaken the living waters. Jeremiah 17, 13. Oh, Lord, the hope of Israel, which also is mikvah, you know, the water of Israel. All that forsake you will be ashamed. Those that depart from me shall be written in the earth because they've just forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. He's writing their names in the earth because they've just forsaken the fountain of living waters. This is why you have to connect John 7 to Jeremiah 17. That helps us understand. Now, just like your sin will find you out, look at Jeremiah 2, 19 and 20. Your own wickedness is what's going to correct you. Your backsliding will reprove you. Know therefore and see that is an evil thing and a bitter that you have forsaken the Lord your God. My fear isn't in you, says the Lord, the Lord of hosts. For of old time, I'm the one who broke your yoke. I'm the one who burst your bonds. And yet you said, I'm not going to serve you. 
For on every high hill and under every green tree, you bowed yourself playing the prostitute. They don't want to put on God's yoke. He broke their yoke, put on his yoke, and his yoke is the Torah. Uh, look at Jeremiah 2, 26 to 30. This is just horrible. Just as the thief is ashamed when he's found, so is the house of Israel ashamed. They, their kings, princes, priests, prophets, who tell a stick of wood, you are my father, and a stone, you brought me out. They have turned their back to me and not their face. And in the time of their trouble, they're going to say, arise and save us. But where are your gods now that you have made for yourselves? Let them arise if they can save you in the time of trouble. And we know the time of Jacob's trouble is coming very soon. He says, for according to the number of your cities or your gods, Judah, why will you contend with me? All of you have transgressed against me, says the Lord. I spanked your children in vain. They received no correction. Your own sword has devoured your prophets like a destroying lion. And then Jeremiah 2, right here. This is the saddest thing. Verse 31 and 32. He says, generation, consider the word of the Lord. Have I been a wilderness to Israel or a land of thick darkness? Not why did the heathen, but why do my own people say, ah, we broken loose. We're not going to come to you anymore. Can a virgin forget her ornaments or a bride, her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. So I have this picture of PowerPoint. You know, they broken loose. You're free from the Torah. That's the generation we're in right now that believes they broken loose from the laws of God. They're free from God. That's what we were just talking about. Okay, we've just ended that book. Let's stand. We're going to start the book of Deuteronomy. And we always say this together. Are you ready? Kazak, Kazak, the knit Kazak. Be strong, be strong, and be strengthened. Amen. Avinu Mokeno, our Father, our King, may we all be strengthened at this time and strengthened in our devotion to you. We just thank you, Lord, for all of those whose goal, whose mission is to magnify the Torah and make it honorable once again. And we thank you for all of those who tithe or give offerings to your ministry through us here, Lord, because that's what we want to do. We want to bring revival. We want to bring reformation. We want everyone to come back to you in Yeshua's name. Amen. Together, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break. Here we are again, El Shaddai Ministries. We are going to presenting, be presenting Solomon, the epitome of a human king and yet the biggest failure at the same time. And then I'm also going to touch a little bit on what Danny talked about last week. Uh, it's, there's so much I may end up having to, you know, do some of it next week. Or I'm sure I will as well. But let's begin with the Torah. Deuteronomy. Look at chapter 17 and verse 17. Now you have to remember Moses was like 400 years before Solomon. So they had the Torah. And not only that, they've already experienced Saul as king, David as king. And so they were able to look at all of these rules and know the rules when Solomon became king. And it says here that the king shall not multiply wives. Now that includes, that means kosher wives. Okay. He was not to multiply wives to himself. Why? So that his heart won't turn away from God. And then it says, neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. Well, let's take a look at Solomon. I think if you can look at the picture here, he did have a few wives. Okay. As a matter of fact, he had one 
thousand wives, princesses, and concubines. I think he, maybe he didn't know his multiplication table. <laughs> he's so smart, he's stupid. Uh, but yeah, oh my word. And then he wasn't to multiply silver or gold. We're going to see how he did there. Look at Deuteronomy 7, verse 2 through 4. When the Lord your God will deliver your enemies before you, here's what he says you're to do. You are to smite them. You are to utterly destroy them. You are to make one covenant. No, no covenant with them. Don't show mercy to them. And when it comes to the pagan wives, he says, don't marry them. And don't give your daughter to their son, nor take his daughter for your son. Why? They will turn away your son from following me that they may serve other gods. And then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you and he will destroy you. Well, let's see how Solomon did. Second, or Kings 11, verse 1 and 2. I think it's 1 Kings. But King Solomon loved many strange women together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and even the Hittites. Now, do you remember what Hittites mean? What is the English word for Hittite? Terrorist. Okay. And then look at this specifically. It says, of the nations concerning which the Lord said to the children of Israel, you shall not go into them and they shall not come into you for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. What does clave mean? It means to cling to and it means to catch by pursuit. They weren't pursuing him. He was chasing after them. Now, this is bad news for Solomon because what do we know? One of the seven things the Lord hates in Proverbs 16, 18 is feet that are swift in running to evil. Now, here's the other thing. God didn't respond right away to his multiplication of evil. Sometimes people prosper and do great and they think God either doesn't know or he doesn't care. Well, Solomon probably felt a false sense of security in what he did. Ironically, Solomon was very well aware of this tendency in the heart of man. Look what he himself stated in Ecclesiastes 8, 11, because the punishment that is decreed for an evil act is not promptly carried out, Therefore, people who plan to do evil are strengthened in their intentions. Can you imagine if you stole something, you immediately fell dead? How that would stop stealing? Oh, now I want to do that one. Okay, and because the punishment doesn't happen speedily, we think, I guess, God doesn't know or God doesn't care. But it is his long suffering wanting you to repent because he loves you. That's the only thing. <clears throat> it's sobering to put ourselves in King Solomon's shoes to consider that sometimes when everything seems to be going well in our own lives, it may not be the result of God's blessing, but his abandonment. Things could be going well because, not because he loves what you're doing, it's because he's abandoned you when things are going well. How does that work? Well, look what Jeremiah says during the destruction of the temple. In Jeremiah 12, verse 1, he says, Righteous are you, O Lord, when I plead with you. Yet I have one problem about your judgment, Lord. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? <laughs> That's just, you know, your, your ways are great, but I have one question. <laughs> what is your problem, <laughs> God? And... Look what King David himself wrote in Psalm 73. He says, behold, look at the ungodly. They are the ones who are prospering in the world. They increase in riches. 
And when I thought to know about this, it was just too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their end. Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. How are they brought into desolation? Is in a desolation? Is in a moment they're utterly consumed with terrors? Those who are prospering thinking they have God's blessing when actually he's abandoned them. He's, he's letting them have their little heaven on earth, which is a blink of an eye for eternity. Wow. Okay, so let's look at 1 Kings 11, 3 and 4. What, how does Solomon do? He had 700 wives, princesses, 300 concubines. Man, I don't know why anybody would want two. <laughs> Well, when you think about it, these thousands really only had one reason he did it. It was to make peace with the surrounding nations. He didn't really love any of them. It's just, how do you make peace so the nation won't attack you? Marry one of their daughters. He probably didn't even see 90% of these women during his life. They were just there to, this is the difference between the false peace, false peace and a true peace. He achieved peace by breaking God's covenant. That's how the Antichrist is going to be doing it in these last days. That's how you're going to know. Now, I got a little picture here of what they were to do with the Canaanite idols. Listen to Exodus 34, 13. You shall break down their altars, dash in pieces their pillars, and cut down their asherim. This is an asherim, all right? These are statues they would put up to honor their pagan gods. Now, <clears throat> in Exodus 34, 13, you have to understand the context. They had just worshipped the golden calf, Okay. They just worship the golden calf. Moses is trying to make atonement for them. This is right, you know, around the Feast of Shavuot. And so look at Deuteronomy 7, 5 now. Again, this is how you're to deal with them. Destroy their altars, break down their images, cut down their groves, burn their graven images with fire. And then look at Deuteronomy 12. I want you to utterly destroy all the places where the nations which you shall possess serve their gods. Upon the high mountains, upon the hills, under every green tree. Look at this. You shall overthrow their altars, break down their pillars, burn their groves with fire, and you will hew down the graven images of their gods and destroy the names of them out of that place. So all of the kings and all of the people were to do what? Destroy all the altars. <clears throat> well, let's look how Solomon did in 1 Kings 11, 5 through 8. Solomon chased after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians, after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil right in the sight of the Lord, he did not fully go after the Lord as David, his father did. And then look what Solomon did. He built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of the Moabites in the hill that is before Jerusalem and for Molech. Okay, here's Molech. Molech is the one where you would offer your firstborn in the fire to the god Molech. Solomon built the altar of Molech, and it says on the hill east of Jerusalem, that's the Mount of Olives. So on the Mount of Olives, Solomon built an altar to Molech. And then it says, the abomination of the children of Ammon, and likewise he did for all his strange wives, which burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. Do you know what that means? He built a thousand pagan altars and the wives of those nations sacrificed to their gods. Do you know what that means? Solomon married an Ammonite 
who sacrificed his firstborn to Molech. Solomon was the first king to do child sacrifice. He's the one who introduced child sacrifice to Israel. As a matter of fact, listen to Leviticus 18.21. You shall not let any of your seed pass through the fire to Molech, neither shall you profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Here's what I want you to know. Many of you may not totally know Molech, but the God Molech was actually a God of cruelty. He was also known as Molech, Milcom, and Malcom. Well, the word seems to be derived from the Hebrew word Melech. Molech, Melech. Melech means king. It was, if, it was as if Molech was to be their king. To the Moabites, this god was known as Chemosh. This god was worshipped by human sacrifice, burning their sons and daughters in the fire, and the Israelites would even participate in this pagan worship and dedicate their firstborn infants to this deity in the valley known as Tophet. How many of you have ever heard of the word Tophet? All right. Listen to Jeremiah 2, 31 and 32. Generation considered the word of the Lord. Have I been a wilderness to Israel or a land of thick darkness? Why do my people say, again, here we are. You know, we've broken loose and we're going to come to you no more. You've forgotten me days without number. This is the problem. They have forgotten God. Oh, where, where did I go? I went to the wrong place. Let me see. Oh, I flipped the wrong page. Okay. Oh, here we go. Okay. Look at Jeremiah 7, 30, 31. I found it. Okay. I was just testing you. <laughs> Jeremiah 7, 30, 31. For the children of Judah have done evil in my sight, says the Lord. They've even set their abomination in the house, which is called by my name. They put a pagan altar in the temple itself to pollute it. And they have built the high places of Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I commanded them not, neither did it even come into my heart. What does Tophet mean? If you look at the picture here, Tophet is a place of drums. And if you'll notice in the bottom corner, if you can see this, here they are the drums and they've got their sticks and they're pounding on the drums. Why was it called the place of Tophet? Because the adults would beat on the drums to drown out the cries of the children as they were being sacrificed. In Leviticus 20, 1 through 5. And look at this. And again, this was 400 years before Moses. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, again, I'm telling you again, you shall say to the children of Israel, whoever of the children of Israel or of even of the strangers who are living in the land, who give any of their descendants to Molech, he shall be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. I will set my face against that man. I will cut him off from his people because he's given some of his descendants to Molech to defile my sanctuary and profane my holy name. And now, this is today. This speaks of today. Watch this. And if the people of the land should in any way hide their eyes from the one when he gives his descendants to Molech and they don't kill him, I will set my face against that man and against his family. I will cut him off from his people and all who prostitute themselves with him to commit harlotry with Molech. How often do politicians do things illegal and we look the other way? You know what I'm talking about. How often do so many politicians, someone who's famous or whatever, they get a different sentence than us peons. They look the other way. Do you know what this is saying? Solomon and his wives should have been stoned. 
Oops, but Solomon is doing it. How dare we stone Solomon? Solomon is more important than the word of God. Here the people of Israel not only turned and hid their eyes from Solomon's abominations, they even wholeheartedly joined in and continued the practice for another 400 years. If it's good enough for Solomon, it's good enough for us. The Antichrist, as the ruler of the world, will be given a pass when it comes to his lawlessness. Do we see today's politicians supporting lawlessness? That's what it's all about. Lawlessness. Look at the border. Illegal doesn't mean illegal. In the book of Esther, which is about Haman and the Antichrist, okay, uh, and you look at Hanukkah, you look at all of these stories, they make lawlessness legal. And that's what is happening today. Now, here's the thing. I'm not talking the laws of the UN or the US, but God's laws. Because man, law, man can legalize all kinds of things that are horrible. And so in light of what Solomon and his wives did, the priests and the prophets and the people turned a blind eye because of who he was. Not only that, but they also decided to follow Solomon's bad example for the next 300 years. It wasn't until Jeremiah's day when a new king by the name of Josiah took the helm. Now, look at this. In 2 Kings 23, verse 13 and 14, Josiah the king defiled the high places that were east of Jerusalem, that's the Mount of Olives, to the south of the Mount of Corruption. Look at that. They changed the name of the Mount of Olives to the Mount of Corruption. Which Solomon, the king of Israel, had built for Ashtoreth, the abomination of the Sidonians, Chemosh, the abomination of the Moab, Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites, and he broke in pieces the pillars, and he cut down the Asherim. Solomon built Asherim for inside the temple. Everything that God said the king is not to do, he did. And what he was supposed to do, he didn't. He was supposed to tear down the altars. He built a thousand altars. And he placed many of them on the Mount of Olives as well as in the temple. Now, look at this. This is a big theological shocker. Look at 1 Kings 14.31. Rehoboam. Who was Rehoboam? That was Solomon's son right? Rehoboam becomes king of Israel. Well, look at this. Rehoboam slept with his fathers. He was buried with his fathers in the city of David. His mother's name was Nema, an Ammonitus. And Abijam, his son, reigned in his stead. I want you to think about this for a minute. That means, lucky for Rehoboam, he wasn't the firstborn. Now, he'd have been killed. Secondly, so much for Jewishness being from the mother's side. The very next king after Solomon was an Ammonite, not Jewish. When you look at his mother was an Ammonite, believe me, she didn't convert. Okay, Jeremiah 32, 31 through 35. God says, this city's been to me a provocation. Okay, now this is talking about the last 300 years since Solomon. And he says, they've been the provocation of my anger and of my fury from the day they even built it unto this day that I should remove it from before my face because of all the evil of the children of Israel and of the children of Judah, which they have done to provoke me to anger. Who? They, their kings, their princes, their priests, their prophets, and the men of Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and they've turned to me their back and not their face, though I taught them, rising up early and teaching them, yet they have not hearkened to receive instruction. They set their abominations in the house, which is called by my name, to defile it. They built the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire to Molech, which I commanded them not, neither did it even come into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. Does Solomon still sound like a wise king? I'm just trying to lay all this out. I'll continue it next week as well. 
But what I want to do now is talk a little bit about what Danny was talking about last week. And again, I don't have enough time to touch on all of it. But let me begin with this. How many have ever seen this picture of Moses? Can you see that? Do you see the horns on his head? What? A, a lot of Christianity has Moses with horns on his head. Okay, that's a good question. It's because they don't know Hebrew. Now, if I said that, what does bark mean? Bark could be bark of a dog, bark of a tree. This word, Karen, has like a dozen different meanings. And Michelangelo got the wrong meaning. Karen means horns. But it also means to glow. And so what happens, it talked about Moses. And when he came down from the mountain, how his face shone. That's Karen. And the people back then thought it meant horns, so he, Michelangelo, oh made Moses with horns. <laughs> In Exodus 34, 30, and when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him because his face was shining. But that same word means horns, so they made him with horns. But it meant, and even in this picture, they don't, they put horns of rays, which is wrong. It has nothing to do with that. It just means his face was glowing as well as the Ten Commandments. It's glorious. All right. So that is what can happen when you mistranslate things, which we'll have in this new Bible we're coming out. But look at Deuteronomy 27, 11 through 13. Moses is charging the people the same day saying, these are the ones who are going to stand on Mount Gerizim to do what? Bless the people when they come over Jordan. Simeon and Levi and Judah and Issachar and Joseph and Benjamin. And these are going to stand upon Mount Ebal to curse Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. Okay, so here we go. I've got the Mount of Blessing and the Mount of Cursing. So on your left is Mount Gerizim. On the right is Mount Ebal, and that's where they built the altar, on the mountain of cursing. And I want you to notice that that's further north, so it is pointing toward Jerusalem. All right? Now, these are the tribes, and Levi, they, they were to shout out the blessings and the cursings, both. Blessing and cursings. There's all kinds of phenomenal blessings, but I just want to show you the cursings for a minute. Now, the other thing that Danny had talked about that is so important when it talks about the law, there are different kinds of laws. How do you know in the Ten Commandments, the first ones are how we're to treat God, and then the next ones are how we're to treat one another. So those are two different laws, laws between God and man, and laws between people and people. And the problem in much of Judaism, even to this day, they considered the laws between us and God as being more heavier than the ones between people. Now, do you know what that means? That means how you shake the lulav or put on tefillin has a greater punishment than if you murder somebody. You following me? All of the technical laws of the Torah, this is, and the reason why is they don't care about people. If they're right with their God in their own mind and, and uh, they keep kosher correctly and they keep the Shabbat correctly, I'll get in more trouble with God if I don't do that right, but I won't get in as much trouble with God if I rob from somebody. You following me? So, look at Deuteronomy 27, verse 14 through 16. The Levites are going to speak, and they're going to say to all 
the men of Israel with a loud voice, cursed be the man that makes a graven image and abomination of the Lord, the work of the hands of the craftsman. And then he hides it. He puts it in a secret place. And all the people are to answer and say what? Amen. Then he says, curse be he that doesn't honor his father and mother. And all the people will say, amen. Curse be he that removes his neighbor's landmark. And all the people say, amen. Curse be he that makes the blind to water out of the way. And all the people say, curse be he that perverts judgment of the stranger, fatherless widow. And all the people say, curse be he that goes to bed with his father's wife because he covers his father's skirt. And all the people say, Curse be he that lies with an animal, and all the people say. Curse be he that lies with his sister, the daughter of his father, the daughter of his mother, and all the people say. Curse be he that lies with his mother-in-law, and all the people say. And curse be he that smites his neighbor secretly, and all the people say. Curse be he that takes reward to kill somebody who's innocent, and all the people say. Curse be he that confirms not all the words of this law to do them and all the people shall say what? Amen. Do you realize none of these curses were between man and God? Wow, curse. All the curses are pertaining to how we treat others. None. So how can this be? And people say, don't put me under the law. I want to lie with my mother-in-law and my sister and a beast. See how stupid that is. They don't get it. Let, for, give you an example. Even the first one that, does, that makes an idol and hides it, you might think, well, that's to God. No. Look at Joshua 6, 18. It says, and you in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest you make yourself a curse when you take of the accursed thing and make the whole camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. Well, what did Achan do? Yep. Joshua 7, 1, the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing for Achan, the son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerod, the tribe of Judah took of the accursed thing and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. And in verse 20 and 21, Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils of a uh, goodly Babylonish garment and 200 shekels of silver, a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, I coveted them, I took them, and they are hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. Remember, he says, and you put it in a secret place. Why? Because. All of Israel suffered in a battle and many people died because of what this one person did. So often we think we're not going to hurt anybody, just myself, or I'm going to take advantage of something and no one's going to get hurt. Everybody suffers. Okay, look at Deuteronomy 28, 16 through 20. It goes on and says, what does cursed mean? Okay, we'll be cursed. What happens when we're cursed? Well, it says you'll be cursed in the city. You'll be cursed in the field, cursed in your basket and your store. Cursed will be the fruit of your body, the fruit of your land, the increase of your cattle, the flocks of sheep. Cursed it'll be when you come in. Cursed it'll be when you go out. And the Lord will send upon you cursing, vexation, rebuke, and all that you set your hand to do until you're destroyed and until you perish quickly because of the wickedness of your doings, whereby you have forsaken me. So in other words... We are forsaking God when we do evil to our neighbor. We may think, well, it's not a sin against God. It's a sin against man, which is a lot lighter. No, God says, no, you're sinning against me because they're created in my image. What a concept. Okay. Now, this is going to become a shocker. And uh, the reason I'm doing this is I'm going to be bringing in a verse in Galatians that is totally misunderstood, and I'm just laying the foundation for this. Okay, Deuteronomy 29.1. Okay, this is the last month of the 40 years of wandering. Moses is about to die. Listen carefully. This, they just, he just got done doing 27 and 28 Okay, which is all the blessings and all the cursings. And then he says, 
These are the words of what? The? Which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of where? Wait a minute. The law was given in Mount Sinai. Now they're over in Moab and it says beside the covenant which he made with them in Horeb. So there was a law that was on Mount Sinai, the giving of the Torah. Here is another covenant that he is making with the people in Gentile territory. This is a covenant that is not given in the promised land. This is a covenant that is given in the Gentile area. And it's besides the one he had made on Mount Sinai, it says. And then look at verse 14 and 15. Neither with you only do I make this covenant and this oath, but with him who's standing here with us today before the Lord our God and also with those who are not here with us today. That's us. We are not with them. He's saying this is a covenant that is forever. Now look at verse 29 and 20. After he says all these curses, look at how it concludes. And to me, this sounds much like Christianity. It'll come to pass when one hears the words of this curse that he blesses himself in his heart saying, I'm going to have peace. So I walk in the imagination of my heart to add drunkenness to thirst. It says to that person, the Lord won't spare him. But then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy will smoke against that man. And all the curses that are written in this book will lie upon him. And the Lord will blot his name out under heaven. Many think, well, the law, I ain't under the law. Those curses don't apply to me. Well, guess what? Then neither do the blessings. And there were thousands of blessings. Now, here's the key. Look at Matthew 23, 1 through 5. Jesus is speaking to the multitude and to his disciples. And he says, the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, which means the place of authority. And all that they say to observe, observe and do, but do not do after their works. For they say, and they don't do. They bind heavy burdens and grievous to be born, and then they lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves won't even move one of their fingers to help them. And it says, but all their works they do only to be seen of men. So here's the key. Do you remember in the gospels, there'll be people coming to the Lord and say, Lord, Lord, did not we do all these wonderful works? And he says, they're an abomination. I don't know you. It's because all their wonderful works to be seen of men, not to be seen of God. Now, here's what's so important I want to say that, look at, now, where are we? Matthew 23. Now, tell me if this doesn't follow what we just read in Deuteronomy 27. Look at Matthew 23, 13. He says, a curse is on you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Verse 15, a curse is on you, scribes and Pharisees, you false ones. Verse 16, a curse is on you, blind guides. These are the curses of back in 27 and 28 of Deuteronomy. He's repeating them in Matthew. Look at Matthew 23, verse 23 and 24. A curse is on you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you make people tithe on all sort of sweet-smelling plants, but you give no thought to the more important things of the law, which is righteousness and mercy and faith, but it is right for you to do these and not let the others be undone, you blind guides who take a fly out from your drink, but make no trouble swallowing a camel. Okay, what is that all about? First off, what he's saying is, you guys, when it comes to people-to-people -people relationships, put heavy burdens on them, okay? And then it's... Uh, a, a fly is not kosher or a gnat, but neither is a camel. And he's saying the little things, okay, you'll strain out, but the big things you'll swallow. 
The problem is he's saying the big things are your relationships with one another. That's what you have to get right. And they just concentrate on their relationship with God in their own technical mind. They're, they're legalistic. They're following the technicalities, but they're forgetting the weightier matters. So we have to understand there are things that are weighty that God's real concerned about. And then there's things that God's concerned about, but not as much. They, they should be equal. That's the whole thing. They're supposed to be equal. Our attitude of how we do what we do to God, we have to have the same attitude of how we treat people. So if we love God, we have to love people. Now, this is why it says in Matthew 5, 23 and 24, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and remember your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and first be reconciled with your brother and then come and offer your gift. God is saying it's more important you make it right with one another before you try to make it right with me. So do you see the difference? There's, there's two sets of laws. Laws between man to man and laws between humanity and God. The problem is the Pharisees and the scribes put the weightier laws on how you keep Passover and keep the matzah. And they make that all important. And you see that in the Messianic movement today. Everyone tries to look Jewish or they, they're trying to keep all the laws of the Torah technically, but they treat everybody else horrible. That's the problem with the Messianic movement. And there's many people who think if they just look Jewish, they're in. It's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Okay, now here comes this totally misunderstood verse. Galatians 3.10. All who rely on the works of the law are under a what? Curse. Curse. What? I don't you put me under the law, then I'll be under a curse. It says, for it is written, curse be everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law to do them. That's what we were just reading. Okay, but that is in the context of the laws between man and man, not the laws between man and God. So whenever you see the word law, it doesn't mean the entire Torah. This is directly referring where this verse is, which is in about the laws between man and man. Now, how many of you have ever gotten a speeding ticket? You don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> but, oh, I see people pointing at their neighbor. <laughs> Here's the thing. Can you go to the judge and say, look at all the times I didn't speed? What is he going to say? Are you crazy? You broke the law. Well, that's the same thing. We are not justified by the works of the law. I don't care how much good you've done. If you kill somebody, you can't say, oh, but I dumped the trash for my mom. <laughs> it doesn't work. Okay, so if you're relying on the works of the law, you're under a curse because everyone's broken the law. Therefore, everyone has to be judged. And the purpose of the law was so we would realize we need a Messiah. And that's what people don't get. And then it says this. Galatians 3, 11 through 13. It's evident no one is justified before God by the law. Why? Because you've broken it. So how can the law justify you? It says the righteous shall live by faith. And of course, that comes from... Uh, Habakkuk, they've always taught the righteous live by faith. The Jews don't do works to be justified. That's what so many Christians misunderstand. They do works because dad told them to do those. Just like a child, if dad says to dump the trash, they don't dump the trash so they could be his son. They dump the trash, okay, because dad told them. If the neighbor kid runs over and says, I'll dump the trash, can I be one of your kids? It doesn't work that way. Okay, and then it says, the one who does them shall live by them. But then it says, Messiah redeemed us from what? It doesn't say he redeemed us from the law. He redeemed us from the 
curse that's within the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everyone who hanged on a tree, which is what Deuteronomy 21, 22 and 23 says. Uh, he that is hanged on a tree is a curse. Now, when they hung someone, that was after they died. They didn't hang them to kill them. They were already dead. And then they would hang them on a tree, just like Haman's sons. Haman's sons were all killed, and then they were hung. They weren't hung to be killed. Yeah, yeah. So that it was always death first, and then they would hang them. But I want people to realize that verse where it says all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, it's specifically referring to the laws between man and man. It had nothing to do with the laws between man and God. Does that make sense? Praise God. Let's stand.